Hi everyone, I'm Fonz and I would like to talk about using JavaScript inside Pluto. So you've already seen that Pluto is designed to be interactive and using things like Pluto UI, you can do all sorts of cool explorable stuff um, and you can combine that with plots. And most of the interactive notebooks you've seen so far, just use those two things like visualization and basic inputs. But if you uh, are interested, you can use HTML, CSS, and JavaScript to create like even cooler inputs and outputs. Um, as a basic example, you've already seen Pluto UI, which is written as a Julia package, and there's nothing Pluto special about it. It doesn't get special treatment. Uh, you could have written the package yourself. Um, the package contains uh, objects like the slider and when they're displayed to HTML, they show inputs, CSS and JavaScript. First example is you've seen the markdown macro, there's also an HTML macro and you can do things like um, a header. This is how you write a header in HTML. Um, you can also do CSS and let me quickly show JavaScript. So if you put a script tag inside uh, HTML output, then Pluto will run that script. Okay, so that was a one minute summary of my talk. Um, from this point on, I'm going to assume that you already know HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. If you don't, take a look at my notebook. I have some tips on uh, how you can learn it. Um, so the first thing, the, the most essential thing is if you write JavaScript inside Pluto, then you can create custom at bind inputs. So <clears throat> um, the basic idea is that at bind, when I do uh, at bind to hello, um, I can give it an HTML element like a slider. And then Pluto will take the latest uh, dot value uh, of that HTML element, but it doesn't need to be one of the default inputs. You can actually write your own inputs. So as an example here, um, so I have this code, but also again with highlighting, um, I have a button and then I have a script where I select that button using uh, the query selector, then I have a variable count, and whenever you click the button, I increment the counter, and then I do this. I say the div, so that's the wrapper, the wrapper div. I set the value to be the current count, and I dispatch a new custom event. And this pattern, setting the value and dispatching an event, is how you create custom bind inputs. So what this is doing is whenever I click it adds one to the counter. So I encourage you to open a notebook, try this out for yourself. And here I put some suggestions of things that you could try to do, like um, add a second button to reset the value to zero. Uh, next, quite important, is debugging. So how do you debug things when you're writing custom HTML, CSS, and JavaScript? You use the browser developer tools. Um, you can Google this, um, you, you, I have it open here on the left. So the first thing is, can you find this message in the console? It's right there, make sure you can do that. And then the second thing is, can you find out which CSS class this is? And what's cool is Pluto is just another web page. So you can do right click inspect, and then you can find that element. And so you'll see that Pluto, this is where Pluto uh, ends and your code begins basically. So you have your Pluto output and then you get a div and inside that div is whatever HTML output you uh, output. Okay. So one important thing is how do you select elements? This is, this is often important that you, you output something like a plot or a button or a table. And then you have a script where you want to select that object to do things like add event listeners or set the value. And so um, you might think we just do document.body.select, but the problem is 
The problem is when you have multiple widgets, when users take your widget and use it multiple times, then all of those selectors are going to point to the first one. So for this, we have a handy feature, which is inside your scripts, you can access a variable called current script, which is the which is a reference to the current script node that your code is in so you can use this um, so your current script then you go up to the parent elements to get the wrapper div and then from there you can um, do any kind of selector that you want and so this is a useful pattern that you have one big wrapper div and then inside of it you do all of your uh, html elements and then finally, you do a script where you first select that wrapper div and then you go from there. And if you're creating a custom bind input, then this div is the element that should fire the input event and that should set the value property. Okay, next up. Um, so, right, we talked about a custom bind, which is how you get value from JavaScript to Julia. And now, how do you do it the other way around? So go from Julia values to JavaScript or like to custom output. You do it using interpolation. So in Julia, you have string interpolation. Um, you might know that you have markdown interpolation, but Julia by default does not have HTML interpolation. So here you have the HTML macro and you see that it does not work. Um, and that's because it's kind of non-trivial. And there's a package that we had a presentation about today called Hypertext Literal, which has a special macro, HDL, and then it all works. So we highly recommend this package. Um, and here's an example showing the cool features. Um, so you see that we interpolate this uh, list and then each list item like uses HDL again. And so we're interpolating <clears throat> this like array of cool features. Read the notebook, it's nice. Uh, yeah, why don't we just string interpolate and then uh, use that as HTML? And that's because of escaping rules, essentially. So um, HTML needs escaping and a package like hypertextlittable.jl does it all for you. Okay, so that's how you get um, custom, like how you generate HTML out of your Julia objects which can be like a super powerful feature. If you if you just take one thing away from this talk, it would be uh, download hypertextdoodle.jl and try it out. It's really nice to be able to generate your own uh, HTML based on your data. And then you can really customize how you display your results to other people. Okay, so then if you do want to dive into JavaScript, uh, how do you interpolate your data? So how do you get your Julia data into your JavaScript? Uh, you use JSON. So the funny thing about JSON is JSON encoding means uh, JavaScript syntax for writing that object. So if you just JSON encode something, you can just put that in your JavaScript and it will work. So that's what we do here. Here I have my data. And then <clears throat> to get it into my JavaScript, I say constant data equals, then I interpolate a string and the string is the JSON uh, string of my data. And then I like, create text nodes for all of these things. And you see that, of course, it's reactive. <clears throat> yeah, so on the website, you can, you can see this all with syntax highlighting. Uh, next up, part of the essentials is how do you get your scripts there? For example, if you use D3, Preact, um, Lodash, like whatever library you would like to use. Um, one way is to do ES6 imports. Um, so that's like the future of JavaScript, right? Um, unfortunately, like normal static imports don't work, but there's a simple alternative, which is to, to do the dynamic import with await. So we support top level await inside your cells. So you would write this as this. And so this is, for example, how you would import the, the confetti, the confetti library and the preact library. And then the second method is you just put script tags, like the classical script tags in your HTML output and Pluto will all treat it correctly. Um, 
if you if it sees the same script a second time then it doesn't load it so don't worry about putting your script tags everywhere okay so those were the essentials um next the kind of advanced things and so the clue here is that uh, we love observable that's a reactive notebook for javascript and we try to make our javascript runtime be very close to the one you have in observable so that the skills that you learned there you can just use them directly in pluto um, we recommend trying out observable it's a really cool tool, uh, also a good, good way to learn JavaScript. Um, and the skills you learn there will apply to Pluto. Um, also, their documentation is awesome. It's interactive. It's, it's super cool. Uh, so try it out. The main features from Observable that we uh, have mirrored are if your script tag uh, returns an HTML node, then we will display it. Uh, and the second thing kind of related is the observable standard library is also imported in your uh, script tags in Pluto. So you can use uh, DOM, HTML promises, uh, etc. <clears throat> so as, as an example of these features, um, like before here, I have my <coughs> data, I JSON interpolate, and now I'm using the <coughs> HTML string um, template literal thing from observable to, to return an HTML DOM node, which is an unordered list of, and then I map my data to this film function, which takes the title, the director, and the year, and then creates like a little text. And you see, because I'm returning <clears throat> an HTML node, Pluto will attach it to the DOM after the script is finished running. Sorry, so here it is with syntax highlighting. Uh, I take a look. <clears throat> Next, uh, another feature that we mirror from Observable is that you can have stateful output with this. So in JavaScript, the global variable this is like um, kind of mysterious, but um, in Observable, uh, this is set to undefined, except when a cell runs for a second time. So when a cell gets triggered reactively to rerun, um, this is equal to the last output, so the output from the last time that it ran. And so, in particular, this is useful if you return an HTML node. So an HTML node, like like before, like it's it's getting displayed. Um, you can use this to then get the HTML node that was displayed last time. And uh, for example, for performance reasons, you can update the previous HTML node return it again, and then um, uh, Pluto will persist that node, like it never leaves the, the DOM. So one thing is performance, and you can use D3 or Preact to uh, do partial updates to the DOM. The second thing is that you can have stateful output. So you can assign some variables to the thing that you returned, and then you get those back. <clears throat> so um, as an example here, I have a block that is triggered by this variable assignment, and then it renders the same script. <clears throat> so this variable is not interpolated or anything. So if I run this, it says I'm running for the first time. But if I run the trigger, then this cell will re-render. But <clears throat> in my script, I'm saying uh, this is current. So I'm, I'm logging to the console, actually. Let me. Let me show that. So um, <clears throat> if I run it for the first time, it says this is currently undefined. And then if I run the trigger, it says this is currently block quote. And so that's the last thing that was uh, that was returned. So now if I run it another time, uh, it's it's saying I was triggered by reactivity. And so in this example, I'm just using it to show something when it runs for the second time. Uh, but you can use it for very cool things. So for example, here I'm using the D3.js library. Um, and D3 um, 
one of its powerful features is that it has animations and that's really cool. And so in this example, I'm reusing the, the SVG generated from last time and just updating it. And then I let these three handle the transitions. So, um, right, so here I have a text input and it's parsed and then I get the array of dot positions that I want. If I update, you see that the dot positions uh, change, but notice that they transition even though the cell is re-rendering because it depends on the variable dot positions, um, it reuses the DOM node from before, so the SVG. And I do that by saying, if this is null, then create a new one, otherwise take the old one. And so, so you can, you can, in this case, I'm using it for these three transitions, which is really cool. Um, Uh, another another way to use it is with Preact. So, I if you want to use Preact, I recommend taking a look at this example. So here I have my data, so X and X. Um, let's see, this is the Preact state, <clears throat> and the state just has one field, which is X. Um, and when I update the state, so let's say hello Pluton. Uh, you saw that only the first element updated. And to make updates clear, I added a timeout <clears throat> where for the first second it says loading, and then <clears throat> it shows the actual value. And you see things like if I now remove one, then all of these got shifted one up. Um, if I change a number, if I add something new, <clears throat> that new element just gets added. Um, so yeah, if you want to use Preact, I recommend using this snippet. I put a comment like the Preact app starts here and everything before it is kind of the boilerplate you need uh, to have this persistent state. Um, <clears throat> right, and then finally, uh, what's maybe cool to say is, of course, Pluto is, itself is a web page. It is written in JavaScript. Um, and so you can also manipulate the page itself. Um, as a super basic example, let's say for each Pluto output, header one should be um, a cursive font. And that should have been inside of a style tag because I'm trying to write CSS. And now, so this is a header two, this is a header one. You see that I can change like the way my notebook looks. Um, okay, so that was CSS. Um, the other thing is you can like use JavaScript to select cells and you can add like uh, DOM mutation listeners and that sort of stuff <clears throat> to, I don't know, kind of hack into the way the editor works or a good example is the table of contents. Um, it's part of Pluto UI and you can read the source code. Um, the table of contents is also reactive. <clears throat> so you saw that I just changed, okay, manipulate the editor. So if I remove the word itself, it also gets removed from the table of contents. Now this table of contents, <clears throat> the first thing is, why is it on the right? Why is it not inside a cell? And that's because we just say uh, position uh, fixed and then it's stuck to the screen instead of stuck inside the cell. And then the second thing is how did it know that this cell changed because um, the table of contents cell doesn't depend on this cell so it's not rerunning. And that's because we have a mutation observer on every cell. So yeah, uh, if you want to take a look at this first code for table of contents, um, it's a bit hacky but uh, yeah, also get in touch if, for example, you would like some API to be added or some feature that's currently hidden to be more public. Uh, and we'd love to hear what you think. And yeah, I think, uh, so I want to, to motivate you to try out at least HTML and CSS inside Pluto. That's already really cool just by being able to customize the way your, your results are displayed. 
uh, you can make awesome documents. And then if you're up for it, try out JavaScript. Um, we love JavaScript, of course, uh, and we try to make this a cool environment to use JavaScript in. All right, thank you.